All right, so thank you everyone for joining us today and, and welcome to the inaugural, inaugural webinar uh, of our five part discussion series that we're calling Creating a League of Your, Our Own, a Renewable Energy Cooperatives, uh, Renewable Energy Cooperatives in Canada discussion series. My name is uh, Marc-André Pigeon or Marc-André Pigeon and I am the director of the Canadian Centre for the Study of Cooperatives. Before we begin today's event, I want to acknowledge that I live and work in what, what is called Treaty 6 territory. And as such, I live in relationship with the nations that were in our parties to this treaty and similar agreements. So the Cree, the Soto, Dene, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and Métis nations. And I think of when I think of living in relationship, I mean, we, I, we all have a responsibility to be stewards of this land so that our children, their children, and so on have good access to drinking water, clean air, and a stable and predictable climate. So that hopefully they too can grow, prosper, and realize their potential. And so this conversation series is about reaching for, however imperfectly, that, that sustainable future, that shared future of relationships. Um, and it builds on a project led by myself, Martin, Martin Boucher, and Renata Len Lennonhart, um, where we looked at, we tried to we pull together a, a census of renewable energy cooperatives in Canada. And that, that census helped us to identify how many active renewable energy cooperatives there are in the country, where they are, how much and what type of energy they're generating, and what are their challenges that they're facing. And, and so from that, from that project, we learned that the rec sector is experiencing some challenges in scaling up and taking up more space in Canada's efforts to kind of address the climate change. Um, and so, you know, this country, Canada, we've set a target to achieve net greenhouse, net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And, and one of the ways you get there is through renewable energy. And that's why the rec sector can and should be so important. Now, that work and, and what we're talking to you about today and for the next few months is, is made possible by a few people or organizations I want to flag. So the Cooperators uh, Insurance Company, who put a lot of effort and time and money into thinking about climate change and doing what they can to address it. Uh, Cooperatives First here in Saskatoon, uh, the Alberta Community and Cooperatives Association in Alberta, uh, the British Columbia Cooperative Association in BC, St. Mary's University's um, International Center for Cooperative Management and Royal Ro Roads University. Um, we've all kind of come together to build out this discussion series and explore again, how renewable energy cooperatives can make a, a more meaningful uh, and timely contribution to Canada's efforts to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Um, this discussion series is also important um, because it leads to an in-person gathering that we're organizing from May 25th to 27th at St. Paul's University in Ottawa. And at that event, we're gonna put the ideas that we're gonna be talking about today and over the next few months into action. And we're gonna see if there's an appetite for the cooperatives, the renewable energy cooperatives to do what cooperatives have always done when they try to build scale. And that is collaborate uh, by forming this thing we, we're calling a league. Um, so from now until then, each installment of this discussion series will be held on the third Wednesday of each month at 12 p.m. Saskatchewan time. And it's gonna be on Zoom and it's gonna be open to anyone. And we're gonna be recording these sessions because from these conversations, we're gonna be building briefing material and content that will inform our in-person event in May. So that's a bit of background, a bit of context. Uh, we're really looking forward to a great conversation. Uh, with that, I'm gonna pass things over to my colleague, Martin, who's gonna introduce our speaker, Julie MacArthur. Uh, Martin, over to you. Thank you, Marc-Andre. Uh, and I'm really excited to introduce our speaker, Dr. Uh, Julie MacArthur, who's a thought leader in the country on energy transitions, co-ops, inclusive sustainability. And I'm going to do her a horrible, horrible injustice and provide a summary of some of the, the highlights uh, as I see it. But note that um, she's done a lot of really wonderful things in this space. Um, so she's currently an associate professor and Canada Research Chair, a Brand Spank, a new Canada Research Chair in Reimagining Capitalism at Royal Roads University. She's the author of a really fantastic book, Empowering Electricity, Cooperative Sustainability and Public Sector Reform in Canada. I encourage folks to take a look at that. Uh, she's also the author and editor of numerous articles, book chapters on energy, democracy, inclusive, low carbon, transition, participatory environmental governance and comparative energy policy. And recently she was also the past Chair of the International Wiser Network, which stands for Women and Inclusivity in Sustainable Energy Research. So hopefully, Julie, I did not do you 
too much injustice to your wonderful accomplishments, but enough about me. Let's turn it to our esteemed speaker today, Dr. Julie MacArthur. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for that. Uh, you did me no injustice whatsoever. And I've uh, just started sharing my screen. I want to say um, thanks so much to the organizers of today, to Martin, Marc-Andre, and Stan um, for including me in this series. So as Martin very kindly said, I have been working in this general area and field for a decade and a half now, um, which goes very, very quickly. Um, and I'm really delighted to be able to provide, so today the aim is to provide kind of like a high level picking off for our discussion series that we're going to do. Um, and, and the overall theme here obviously is what is the role of cooperatives in the energy sector in Canada? And why would we want policymakers or cooperators to be thinking about energy co-ops specifically? So I'm not too sure what our audience is. So often I'm speaking either to university students or to policymakers or to people in the broader community energy sector. And each of those, um, has some gaps when we talk about this stuff, right? So policymakers very rarely focus on co-op specifically, unless you get a niche niche person in, in a corner um, area, usually of an economic development group. Um, people in energy transitions, the community and cooperative sector is usually quite a big gap. So today I'm gonna try to bring a little bit of an overview to, to a number of things. Um, so, we're gonna talk about why energy cooperatives. What's the context that pushes the interest in this area? In Canada specifically, where are the co-ops? What do we know? Where are the data gaps? And what does the literature look like? And then after that, I'm gonna turn um, in a, just a couple of little slides to what looks like is happening in other countries. New Zealand, the UK and Denmark are the three. Um, and again, very briefly, so hopefully we can get into more detail later after the talk, but also most of these topics are huge in and of themselves. So hopefully this is something we can keep following up on um, in, in other conversations. But I chose one word in the talk, revolutionizing the energy transition intentionally to be provocative. So a revolution change. We're looking at wholesale radical system um, change. And I want to start with why I think that is actually the important thing to talk about. So we are in a context of energy crises and what I would call, and many others who study climate policy change, climate policy under reaction. So the image I have up here is from the UN Environment Program. It's their, um, it's their, um, their, climate gap report that they put out every year. And essentially what's important to take away from this that many of you listening probably are aware of is that current policies, even the policies that we are coming up with to strengthen and reduce net zero um, carbon capture and storage, everything we've thrown at the climate problematic is nowhere near where we need it to be to get to even two degrees, let alone 1.8 or 1.5. So you see on that image kind of a, a, a decrease. And as we get to more of the, the conditional nationally determined, that's the NDC scenarios, we're seeing reductions, but nowhere near where we need to be. And more depressingly, what we also see is that the promises we make, which are those already inadequate promises, are not being implemented effectively enough to see the actual physical reductions in the gases that we need. So there's a huge pressure then to try to understand why. Why do we have completely inadequate, essentially, um, climate policies and climate policy in implementation? And some of the answers are starting to come up in the larger reports we're seeing from even um, not particularly radical organizations like the International Energy Agency, the International Renewable Energy Agency as well. So in the most recent report from IRENA, they say compounding crises underscore the pressing need to accelerate the global energy transition. And this is what leads me to say we really do need far more radical and revolutionary change than what we've seen. Um, from the war in the Ukraine, oil and gas prices soaring, the COVID-19 pandemic continues to hamper recovery efforts. This is from them again. 
Um, and that the IPCC rewards that between 3.3 and 3.6 billion people already live in settings highly vulnerable to climate change. So I'm located on the ancestral lands of the Lekwungen and Kusapsum peoples um, on Vancouver Island in British Columbia. And we have seen, since I moved back from New Zealand uh, about two years ago now, we have seen flooding, um, the whole towns burned down in the center of BC. We've seen just climate catastrophe, climate catastrophe is just in rolling kind of crisis waves. So this is not the story that we had, I think even 15, 20 years ago, where it is just so present and current and um, critical. So addressing the climate policy challenges also we're seeing in these um, international level reports is not something that is necessarily about the new technologies and technological issues. What we're seeing is political breakdown, political deadlock, social and, um, and the social license for the radical sc scale of change that we actually need. So in the International Energy Agency's most recent 2022 Global Energy Outlook, they actually said inclusive people-centered approaches are essential to allow vulnerable communities to manage the costs of cleaner technologies and ensure that the benefits of transitions are felt widely across societies. All right, so we're seeing much stronger language about extending and expanding who owns, controls, decides, and is involved in energy transitions. And this is really what leads us to looking at new forms of economic organization or old forms again, thinking about who is actually sitting at the decision-making table and who benefits. So really what I'm focused on and increasingly what others in the climate policy area are turning to is the importance of social license inclusivity, political will, and also the distributive effects of climate policy. Not just are we getting new tech, but who gets to participate in that tech. So moving from the global level to Canada, um, there have been a wide range of policy efforts that I won't spend a ton of time on and hopefully most of you are, are aware of. But certainly when people say we're not moving fast enough in Canada, the rebuttal or rejoinder is usually, but we have these incredible targets, you know, the 2030 target to get to 40 to 45 percent below 2005 emissions. Um, but what we see from the International Energy Agency coming back is that we need five times larger um, emissions reductions targets to get ourselves to 1.5. So even the big promises that are such a shift at the federal level from a decade ago are nowhere near where we need to, get, to be. The other story from the Canadian point of view is that we live in and exist in this federal system where much of the action in the energy sector is at the provincial level. Extremely different uh, ownership systems, um, supply sources for energy needs, um, distribution, and at every single province and territory. Um, so in Canada, while we have this rollout of policies on the transport level, and um, at the federal level, we're still not seeing these huge reductions. So what I've put up on the slide is just an illustration of this. While we do see decreasing intensity per capita, we are not necessarily an error per unit of GDP. So our economic activity is growing, but um, our, our share of greenhouse gas emissions not as quickly. The actual emissions themselves that are so important to climate change are, if anything, you know, bumping around there, but not showing the same kind of significant decrease. And importantly, and this is my last bit of context before we focus on the co-op story, is that provincial variation, not just in greenhouse gases, but in the industries and in the forms of organization, and even in the cultures from province to province. So what's up there on the slide is in dark blue, 1990, in black 2005, and the most recent data on this um, in 2020 in gray is in some provinces we're seeing increasing emissions, right? So not decreasing. So all of this goes to show that um, the importance and significance and, and the challenge of actually getting deep, wide reductions and the importance of 
multi-level understanding. So not just at the federal level, but what's happening at the local level? What's happening in people's kitchens, in people's workplaces? What's happening in terms of the decision-making around what we use, what we consume and, and what new technologies we have? Before we started the talk, actually we were having a chat because um, my gas stove uh, just got capped because we're getting, we're electrifying basically in my house everywhere that we can. And this is actually this shift around the pollution levels of stoves in people's kitchens has become a massive cultural debate, not just in the United States, but in places where um, research has come out about the health effects of stoves. And so this is where I say the, the more granular understanding starting from the big picture of why do we need to transition away from um, carbon dioxide and, and greenhouse gas emissions needs to go all the way down to the kitchen table. And this is where I think cooperatives and community level organizations can help to bridge between that big picture and, and the everyday, which is absolutely essential to any sort of lasting political and policy change. So, um, uh, Peter Newell um, wrote a recent book on the global political economy of energy transitions. And what he says in this, I think, is really important. He says, how to transition to zero carbon economies in timely and fair fashion is one of the greatest challenges that the world faces. But it requires a power shift away from the beneficiaries of a high carbon economy towards disparate actors in the front line of climate change and those that can gain from a more sustainable economy. So in the terms of electrification of your stove or putting in heat pumps or whatnot, the efficiency gains of not having to pay for those increasing costs of fossil fuels, right? So how do we find ways to make it beneficial for everyday people, not just those who can afford the Teslas or the induction stoves or whatnot, to benefit from this transition away from fossil fuels. Newell also says that the scale of the shift across regions, sectors, and actors is without historical precedent, because what we're talking about is not just how we produce our electricity, wind turbines versus gas, it's also about how we transport ourselves, how we power the computers that we're sitting here on, how we understand um, what energy is and what it does and how it needs to be priced. I mean, it's a wholesale transformative change. And so in the literature on what's called community energy, what we've been talking about, and what people who work in this area have been talking about is a shift in thinking about energy systems and the production, distribution, retail of them as something that is owned by either a large centralized actor. So as in much of Canada, we have our public utilities. Um, or a private, a distant and private actor, often foreign owned, but not always. So you see in this image on the slide, a shift between distant and private to local and collective. So the people proximate to the technology itself, um, the people living in the area around the technology, the people using the technology. And the other distinction that is made in this area is around how open and participatory the decision-making and processes are in these organizations versus closed and elite based. So here we're saying a governance shift or the, or the push for a governance shift. So we, we get more diverse people at the table making the decisions. And this importantly is not just for instrumental reasons. It's not just because we have policy goal A and we need people to do what we want. It is in fact also to flip that arrow and say that if you're talking to people in various regions of the province, not just in one area, um, you're gonna get different ideas. You're gonna hear about challenges and pressures that you haven't before because it's not the same kind of cadre at the table that has been benefiting from the current system or doing just fine under the current system. So it's about including at a much deeper level. And of course, one of the things people say um, and I'll go over some of the pluses and minuses in a bit, but it um, is that, well, not everyone has the time or energy. And of course, there are many challenges in designing how that participation looks. There's a huge literature on federating, on um, 
on, on how to include diverse groups. And indeed that is, has been one of the criticisms of community and cooperative energy is that it is not inclusive of everyone in a particular community. Um, so that's something that's important to note going forward. But where we're at right now is, there is a massive global need for an energy transition, a rapid and a deep one, and a ra rapid and a deep one is unlikely to occur, extremely unlikely to occur with the same sets of people sitting around the table who have um, produced and benefited from the current system that we have. So a lot of this has to do with the importance of democratizing and including a far, um, wider group of folks. Um, and the benefits of this have to do with the political feasibility. People are more likely to support projects if they have a stake and a say, and they feel like they have some control over it rather than something being done to them. Um, the other benefits that come from this kind of localization, not in terms of small, tiny projects, but in, about um, ability to participate in them has to do with increased energy literacy, um, a buy-in and public support, resilience of supply, and I'll touch on some of those um, as we move forward. So the cooperative sector itself, when I started working this area, I focused specifically on cooperatives. And I really love this quote by Alexander Fraser Laidlaw, where he says, no cooperative exists in a vacuum, but must operate in a given economic and social environment. It must strive to modify and improve that environment but can't do so unless it recognizes the overriding problems, first of the immediate community, and then the region, finally of the nation, and then humanity of in itself. I mean, it's just so wonderful and all encompassing, right? But I think it's really important for this discussion about energy cooperatives, because it's not about building an organization for its own sake. It's about meeting real pressing needs that arise from the um, crises of the cost of living, the ability of people to actually heat their homes or cool their homes when they need to. Um, and so the question is, back to the quote, what is the relevance of cooperatives to the nation's basic problems? And my argument would be that there is a significant benefit um, on a few different fronts. One of them has to do with the, the role of profit in a cooperative. And not all cooperatives, of course, treat this the same. There's huge variation. But the, intern, the cooperative movement is a movement, and that makes it distinct in and of itself. So I've, I've thrown up on the slide here, for those unfamiliar with cooperatives, the seven cooperative principles that go from open and voluntary membership to democratic control. So already we're seeing within the international cooperative principles part of this, you know, uh, one of the oldest social movements in the Western world in particular, um, some of the elements that are essential to the energy transition in terms of that openness, the democratization, the focus on education and training and not profit maximization. And I think that is one of the reasons why if someone hasn't spent much time thinking about cooperatives, um, they are an important organization to include when we're looking at how to deepen and widen and democratize energy transitions. So cooperatives have a very long history that I have no time to go into right now, but they're incredibly understudied, not just in Canada, but around the world. In countries like New Zealand co-ops, the co-op sector accounts for about 20% of the GDP of the country. It's huge. Much like the energy sector, cooperatives are varied from province to province and the energy and cooperative cultures are quite different across Canada, which again gets to the importance of a federated approach to looking at the, the impact of energy co cooperatives. So I wanted to touch on what this looks like in different countries. So we have the importance of the transition that social and political change is incredibly important. Um, in the book that Martin mentioned that I wrote, um, so it's based on data from 2011, most of the survey. So the survey that Martin, Marc-Andre and uh, Renata did um, is the most up-to-date that I'm aware of so far on the status. And what they were looking at is renewable electricity cooperatives, renewable energy cooperatives, sorry. 
In my book, what I'm looking at is co-ops in electricity, period. So what you're seeing up on the slide, and I went way back to 1940, and I was trying to understand where in Canada these electricity utility cooperatives existed and why they existed in particular locations and what the impact was. And what I found there essentially is that in Alberta in particular, um, cooperatives played a huge, and as far as as I'm aware, in the energy discourse in Canada, almost completely unmentioned role in providing utility services to Albertans. Um, a lot of the motivation of this was the, the pro provincial um, resistance to actually building a public utility infrastructure and co-ops stepped in to play a significant role there. But essentially, when we're talking about energy co-ops or electricity co-ops in Canada, there was a massive expansion of them predominantly in Alberta and Quebec um, in the 1940s and 50s. And then in the kind of 1990s is really when a range of new kinds of energy co-ops started developing in Canada. And they haven't just been working on generation. So building solar panels or, or wind turbines, they have been working on the ones in Alberta, distributing electricity in rural areas, distributing gas. Um, the Alberta Gas Co-ops Association is one of the most extensive kind of cooperative utility distribution networks um, in, in the world, which is, is pretty in, incredible. So in Canada, we have a few of these kind of state of the co-op energy sector. Um, mine is one of the older ones, and um, they are absolutely understudied and really fascinating. So the pictures on the slide there on the left are of the um, rural electric co-ops um, putting up the lines, electrifying Alberta, literally. And on the right is a picture of the um, wind share turbine at X place. So if you're in Toronto, this is the turbine that I think is really important for people to be aware of and, and the history of as well, because when it was built, it was the first urban wind turbine in North America. The effect of all of the people driving by and seeing it and the importance of the partnership model that came out of that wind share turbine in Toronto, where it was a partnership between members of the cooperative and also Toronto Hydro. So that public sector and, um, and co-op partnership model is one that I've seen in jurisdictions around the world that has been really effective not infective, but effective, in order to marry the benefits of, um, could be infective as well if you think about it, but with COVID right now, we don't want any associations between that. Um, but marrying the benefits of an existing institution with the bricks and mortar and the knowledge and the resources of the public sector with the community roots, the grassroots, the volunteerism, the many benefits of a co-op. So I'm aware that I've been talking for a while now. Um, and I just want to touch on some of the international examples between summarizing um, a few of the kind of benefits I've been seeing and some of the drawbacks and challenges for a cooperative contribution to energy transitions at radical scale. So um, one of the things that um, Martin Marc-Andre and, and Renata's report highlights, as, as I did in my book, is that many of these kind of more grassroots organizations face a range of challenges. And so this is why on the graph there, it's got operational in progress and inactive installed. And I'm seeing this in the UK right now as well. So there are a huge number of benefits in terms of local resilience to a cooperative led system of things. There's a lot of really good research on cooperatives in crisis and um, the, the, the decision making within cooperatives, especially in the last since the global financial crisis to prioritize keeping the organization running versus folding. However, in the energy sector, there are some real significant challenges um, that come from rapid policy changes in the energy sector, the infrastructural um, requirements, the investment requirements up front, and the long lead times to projects that can make it very challenging for projects. So in Canada and elsewhere, it's really important in these kind of um, in the data exercises to pull apart what's actually active versus what people would love to do. And there is huge unmet um, kind of desire to see more of this, but actually getting it built and operating and sustained is where there are a lot of challenges internationally. 
So I just want to flip in the last few minutes to some of the international experiences. So the picture on the right is myself in Denmark right before the pandemic hit. I was doing some research there on energy co-ops. Denmark is one of the stories in the energy transitions literature where there was high ambition and early action when Denmark vowed to drive down emissions 70% by 2030, and a lot of their energy transition, the picture on the left, had to do with moving from large centralized generation to small and more modular. And it was led largely by cooperatives. Policies that facilitated the investment of farmers and local people in energy infrastructure in their local area. So the project I'm at there, the Middle Grunden um, wind turbine you can get to, is just off the shore of Copenhagen. You take a Zodiac or a dinghy out there. And um, it's actually a tourist attraction. So people travel from all over. And it's another one of these 50-50 partnerships between the um, municipal utility and the cooperative, again, marrying the benefits of the grassroots side of the cooperative, which had investments from local teachers groups, um, uh, local foundations, and a number of um, other organizations. And they redesigned the project to be more appealing for those who, um, who could see it from the land. They helped aid the implementation of the project. And they bring families who are the co-op owners out for visits to the turbines. Again, ticking boxes around energy education and participation and many other things. And Denmark, Denmark really was a leader in terms of facilitating local ownership, not as an add-on side, but as a foundational part of rolling out new energy infrastructure. In the UK, um, this is an image from the State of the Sector report. So in the UK, this is not just cooperatives, this is broadening out to nonprofit associations um, and a range of other actors. In Canada, it would include indigenous organizations who are investing in energy. And the reason I wanted to, to bring this up in this kind of overall overview is that in the UK, they have something that we don't in Canada, which is Community Energy England, Community Energy Scotland, Community Energy Wales as organizations that every year put out this state of the sector. They have the data that every year they can track what's grown, what's stalled, what sources, who's participating, where the funds are coming from, and then use that to um, advocate to policymakers. And we don't have that in Canada yet at all. And it's absolutely essential to, because what I've noticed is that even at the European level, there are European federated community energy organizations and their membership is made up of the national groups like this and groups like Co-ops UK who are funding the policy advocacy, the data gathering, the long term kind of information sharing that's vital to a sector really expanding and making big change. In the UK, there's been a rollback of policy ports despite this, or policy supports despite this, which has been challenging. And the final country area I just wanted to touch on was uh, New Zealand, Aotearoa, New Zealand, where I have spent the last eight years before moving back to Canada. And the important um, highlights I think from New Zealand for this presentation are that in New Zealand, um, even though the co-op sector is very strong, especially, especially as a percentage of GDP, the community energy sector, co-ops were only a tiny, tiny part. And the rationale for that is that for a lot of people interested in developing new renewable assets or helping with energy efficiency or indigenous sovereignty and energy ownership, the cooperative form was not the easiest or the go-to form for them. It was an energy trust, another form of association. And my point here is that then I think it's important that when cooperatives are interested or people are interested in this kind of local distributed, more inclusive energy transition innovation, that the form not be the the priority essentially, that we broaden beyond cooperatives. And this is what we see with Community Energy England. Indeed, we're seeing the same thing in Australia that, that the, the phrase, the, the framework isn't really just co-ops, that the co-op sector working in this area is partnering with a wide range of other groups to get more distributed, more inclusive energy off the ground. The other important project, the um, important elements from the project level in New Zealand, where you see this, the second largest group is energy efficiency. When a lot of people were asked, 
in local communities, what's important for you. Financial savings was a huge part of it. There was the climate driver of, of having more low carbon electricity, but for most people, it's about saving money in their homes. And this energy efficiency piece is a huge part of that. And so in order to meet those needs, that's where the focus was. So there were government um, grants, but it was the nonprofit and community sector that was really reaching into the poorest areas around New Zealand, doing a lot of the really important work. So that's an important piece. I'm just going to skip the policy layers. We could talk about that um, in another discussion. But this, the piece from New Zealand about not just co-ops, but the community sector. And in New Zealand also, a lot of people think community and cooperative is tiny and small projects, but it wasn't. Some of the largest geothermal plants in the world are indigenous owned, they're Maori owned. Um, some of them were partnerships between the state um, agencies on the Maori, but um, this isn't community and cooperative energy isn't about small. Even the the Danish project I I had the picture from there, it was at the time it was developed the largest offshore wind array in the world, and this was a partnership between a co-op and the municipal utility. So this isn't about small. This isn't necessarily about a particular ownership form. The cooperatives are a really important part of it. It is about a whole new way of treating inclusivity and profit and, and what we do with that, um, whether it's large or small, whether it's efficiency or generation flows from that orientation, I would say. So partnerships are, this um, is kind of a list of some of the really key Factors that make this an interesting area to study that requires a lot more effort, I think, in Canada. Um, so that participatory importance of building political capital will and redistributing the resources in the energy sector and reorienting the policymaking to be more inclusive. Um, Co-ops in the community sector has a, have a lot to play in that. So um, already they've been playing a huge role in Europe in remunicipalizing and partnering to remunicipalize energy assets. Um, they've been partnering in a, a lot with anchor institutions like universities um, to roll out EV charging and electric vehicles. And those kind of partnerships are a real strength along with the kinds of participation of local actors bringing in the, the more granular ideas about what works in a particular neighborhood versus the province or the country. So there's a lot of literature on the role of energy literacy and inclusivity and the social reach. So some of the research I did in the UK showed how it was the community energy actors that were going into the lower lower income neighborhoods and doing energy literacy and energy education and bringing in youth from social housing projects to teach about the solar arrays that were on their roof that were part of a whole kind of um, knock on effect of the community sector. On the negative side, Partnerships can also be with actors who use community actors to community wash is something I talk about in the book. Um, they can actually be a door to privatization and a rollback of public um, redistribution in the sector as well. There are real challenges getting the access to capital. Um, sometimes um, the organizations can be disconnected from social movement roots or lack awareness. Um, in New Zealand, again, when folks went to do these kinds of projects, um, co-ops were not what were thought of. It was energy trusts or nonprofit associations. So just to wrap up what I've talked, again, very high level um, talk today, um, in Canada's post-pandemic recovery plan, in the effort and our need to actually radically reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, cooperatives and community actors with them can play an important role in building resilience and increasing democratization especially if they're supported to scale up. And that scale up is the key. And in order to do that, um, this kind of tertiary, so there are a number of things that are needed. Financing, um, a change to the energy, uh, the energy participation rules that allow for local actors to plug in, to have net metering, to have a whole range of um, policies that actually not just treat community actors on the same level, but indeed privilege them because of the knock-on benefits that they provide in terms of the energy literacy, the redistribution, the innovation, the inclusivity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, some of the most sweeping changes that we're seeing are an effort 
um, or are a result of the federating of local actors into kind of meso level organizations that are doing this data gathering and policy advocacy. And that's something we're sorely lacking in order to really scale up what's happening here in Canada. It is important to address that issue of public versus private development and where the community sector sits in that. Um, that is a potential barrier that I've seen from place to place where natural allies who may be supportive are really cautious. And in the Canadian context, the prevalence of public utilities providing energy services in many provinces is something I think that needs to be front footed a little bit more. Um, so the partnerships are important. There is, and this is my last point before we go to conversation on this, um, there is a massive amount of activity that's going on around the world in this area. We are not at the forefront of it, but activities in Ontario um, in the 90s and 2000s and in smatterings across the country show that there are a lot of people interested in this, but we don't have that kind of policy support at the national or even provincial levels to really, um, to really make radical change as yet. And I will leave it there. Thank you so much, Julie. That was fantastic. And uh, I love the ending of scaling up. It's almost as if we planned it that way, because that is our raison d'etre. That is our mission here, is to figure out a strategy to scale up renewable energy cooperatives in Canada. And part of that scaling up, um, is, what's critical to that is hearing from all of you, the renewable energy cooperative sector. So for the next 10 minutes, we're going to do something, we're going to have some fun. But we're going to do something a little bit different and we're going to hear from you. Um, Stan is going to share a Padlet um, activity. You're going to be put into groups. And we really want to hear a bit about what, what, what you found surprising about Julie's talk, what you think are some of the opportunities for renewable energy cooperatives in Canada, and what are some of the threats. And this is sort of critical to us. Um, um, uh, Mark Andre and Stan and the, the the sort of the group working on this to really learn as much as we can about the renewable energy cooperative sector. So we have a lot for food to thought with uh, Dr. MacArthur's talks. You talked about the urgency, the big picture, history. You 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 they talked about scaling up the importance of having things people focused um, and really we and had some international examples to really encourage and inspire us of, of areas where they actually have been successful uh, at scaling up these things. So, and I have a question about the, oh, okay. So Stan, are we ready to go? Yes, we are. All right, breakout so groups starting right now. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Martin. Yeah, before you do, click on the Padlet. So you have a link to the Padlet. Click on that. I'm assuming everybody's clicking away. Oh, there we go. Okay, so let's uh, let's go in the breakouts there, Stan. Okay, all right, 10 minutes for this breakout. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you for participating. I, uh, I realized that we were very, very mean to you and gave you an unreasonable amount of time to think about these, um, these sort of challenging questions, but we really appreciate it. Um, we have a we have a bit of time uh, potentially to ask a, a lingering question for Julie. So Julie's um, uh, Julie's happy to to perhaps answer a question that you have, and she's been generous um, to offer her email address if you want to connect with her outside of this uh, this sort of one hour session. So is there maybe any overall thoughts or or perhaps a question for Julie before we have to. Um, Go our separate ways. Can can I just talk? Go for it. Well, uh, I'm wondering. I I'm wondering, Julie, about your book. If you had pu had put in about the jurisdictions in Canada, and if you broke down how it is that different projects get into the electrical grid in the different jurisdictions, because I realize they're quite different. Yeah, um, so there is there is some detail on that. So a lot of the book, I uh, did like 60, 70 interviews over about four or five years. Um, there was some detail, but 
but it wouldn't be a roadmap to doing it. And that is more than a decade old now, really. That is the thing with books. They sit in production process for a while. So I think um, there is newer information on that that will probably come out of our events the next year. But yeah, so uh, one of the chapters on the book uh, kind of pulls out what's happening at the different provincial level and goes into a few project exemplars around the challenges those projects were having getting grid connected, how they overcame them. Um, but I'd say that is a few pages in the book rather than a whole massive section, which is, I think, likely what people need. I mean, the, the short answer to actually getting that is, is what's needed at each provincial level. We need these models, up-to-date models, because the regs keep changing province to province, you know, every year, and then you write a report, and then it's out of date, you know, a little while later. So we need a one-stop shop in each province. And in a place like Scotland, they've made it even regional to the country, right? So there's the Islands Cooperative Development, which has their energy development specialists, and this is funded by the government. So some kind of federated model like that is what we need. So your question, a little bit, but we could do so much more. And I think the local provincial co-op associations could do some of the help there. Thank you, Julie. Barb. Yeah, there, there's something, Julie, there's something called the Community Energy Association, which you're, I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, and um, I, I think it may have actually started uh, in BC as the BC Community Energy Association. Do you want to talk about that for a minute? Because like, I found this thing, you know, I, I'm, I'm with the um, uh, Mid Vancouver Island Electric Vehicle Association, and, you know, we came across something they were doing. And, you know, so we talked to them and so on. Um, they seem to be putting up charging stations. That's something that, or at least be involved in that. But other than that, like, I can't quite get what they do. I mean, is that something we can, you know, use or, you know, get involved with or, yeah, what do you know about? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm embarrassed to say that actually it's on my to-do list to reach out to them and find out because I, from their website, like most organizations, you go to the about us and it would signify we are a cooperative or we're a nonprofit or we're a, I think generally when people don't identify something like that, it's a private consulting organization. Um, but they look like they're a developer aid for mostly First Nations projects, but open to other things. But yeah, they're on my to do list of reach out and see where they fit because in other jurisdictions like Australia, New Zealand, um, England, something called the Community Energy uh, Association or something like that is usually a kind of federated actor of the local organizations, whereas the BC one you're speaking to seems like a consulting company. But if anyone in this talk knows more, by way of um, explanation why I don't know that is because I recently moved back to Canada after working in New Zealand and all these other places for a while and then promptly went on maternity leave. So I have not. Um, I have my to-do list, but I don't have other than doing what you did, which is basically looking at their website, um, it's not clear whether they consider themselves part of the community sector or not, um, but they seem to be interested in helping the community sector build projects. I've talked to them and the one in BC here at least is government funded pretty much, right? They're, they're doing essentially government sort of like, I guess they're a nonprofit. Um, doing doing government projects and and but the national one I don't know and I don't know if there's one in every province although you go to the bottom of the national website there's a whole bunch of logos and things anyway interesting I wondered if they were something we could build on yeah I think they probably are um the one I'm thinking about is just the BC one though so we might be thinking about two can you plonk in the chat uh the one that you're talking about and I'll do the same thing Thank you. Roger, do you have a quick question? Yeah, just a, just a quick one. Thanks. And um, thanks for the talk, Julie. Um, I was wondering, even the jurisdictions you studied, um, what, what specific policies governments had to support renewable energy co-ops, if there are any? I mean, a lot of changes that we might see in regulation will help distributed energy in general, but not specifically renewable energy co-ops. Are there any in Denmark, Australia, New Zealand, UK that specifically address Renewable energy co-ops? Um, 
You know what, the shift has been towards the community sector rather than the co-op sector specifically. So I know when Ontario was doing a lot of their work, they had to amend the co-op legislation so that they didn't just have to do business with members, right? It could be broader than members because with a good, like electricity, there's a big debate whether it's a good or a service, but with a good like that, you know, you're not, unless you're on a closed kind of circuit, you're not just doing business with the people you're selling more broadly, right? Um, so there were specific changes in co-op legislation that enabled renewable energy co-ops to build, let's say solar panels and sell to beyond the co-op membership. Um, but in the other jurisdictions, Scotland in particular, they actually walked back from just co-ops and broadened to community more broadly because they didn't want it just to be a group of a community who had the capital to invest in the co-op. They wanted the benefit to go more broadly to citizens of a local proximity, right? So their support for community energy was intentionally not focused just on co-ops. So this is part of my, my urge for people to be interested in co-ops, absolutely, for lots of important reasons, but to uh, acknowledge and think maybe more broadly beyond co-ops to other ways to include groups who might not have the capital for investment or who might be um, affected. So it's a long-winded way of saying um, some places, but most of them have not just focused on co-ops for, I think, good reason. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Unfortunately, we're past the hour. I've been a horrible, horrible host um, and not doing my job. I'm going to turn it to Mark Andre to wrap things up here. Great. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Julie. And thank you, everyone, for participating in the conversation today. Um, I think, as you might have noticed in chat, we're going to be sharing a link to the recording for all those who are attendants today, but it will also be up on our YouTube channel, the Center's YouTube channel. And just as a reminder, our next, we're going to have another one of these conversations on um, the third Wednesday in February, which is the 15th. And this time, we're going to hear from another member of our team, Adaria Tehran. Um, and Daria is an assistant professor at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education at the University of Toronto. Um, and he specializes, like Julie, in studying um, this community energy, renewable energy cooperatives. And he's going to be sharing some of his findings from his research around diversity in renewable energy cooperatives, a theme that Julie brought up in her talk. Now, before I let you go, uh, just a couple quick housekeeping things. I want to let you know that we have um, other events we have and related events coming up at the Centre. On the 31st of this month, we're going to have Dr. Bina Agarwal. She's a globally renowned scholar in agriculture uh, and environmental kind of studies. And she's going to be looking at group farming practices um, or talking about group farming practices and climate change in the context of the global agricultural sector, but also Saskatchewan, where she spent several months, uh, several weeks, sorry, um, this past uh, spring. Um, we also have a chat coming up later this month around cooperative housing. Um, that's the first Wednesday of the month, and would welcome all of you to show up for that. It's an important conversation, and I think has linkages back to our, our talk today. So with that, I'm going to thank you all again for participating in our conversation. Please join us next month and for the next few months, and reach out to us about the event in May, which is May 25th to 27th, if you're interested. We have limited spaces, but we are, we are soliciting um, interested parties now. So that's it for now, and look forward to seeing you uh, in February. Take care, everyone.